The Fletcher Seventh-day Adventist Church is a Christian people who believe Jesus is the Son of God, the hope of the world, who died on the cross to redeem us all for eternal life with God. Our purpose is to lift Jesus up and love people in. Visit our website at www.fletchersda.org. And now be blessed by the Holy Spirit as you listen to a Bible message by Pastor Ivan Blake. Our scripture reading today is found in Psalm 32, 1 through 5. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. David, King David used three words, different words for sin. Three different words for sin. Why? Why does he settle for one? Is he trying to tell us that sin is a far bigger deal than we tend to acknowledge? Now, let me tell you right off the bat, I am very awkward talking to you about sin, and there are two reasons for that. The one is that I am disqualified to talk about anybody's sin except my own, and I'm very embarrassed to talk about my own. You know, people who live in glass houses should not throw stones. Is that true? Now, the second reason why I'm embarrassed or awkward in talking about sin is that um, people turn off, switch off once you start talking about sin, even in church, maybe especially in church. We live in a world today where, you know, sin is joked about or it is scoffed at. It seems to be that we live in an age where, where our culture prides itself in avoiding to put people on guilt trips because everybody decides for themselves what is right or wrong, and no one has any right to talk about that or say anything about that. I mean, the worst we have today in our world is decadent chocolate cake, and that's about it. That's about it. So can you understand why I feel awkward talking about sin? You look awkward because I've used the word sin. Oh, that's supposed to get you to relax, but it didn't. So what are we going to do about that? I'll tell you what, friends, there's one reason only why I dare to tread on the thin ice of talking about sin, why I dare talk about sin. There's only one reason, and I find that in 2 Corinthians 5.21. There it says that Jesus, though He was absolutely with no sin in Him at all, yet God the Father made Jesus to be sin. For our sake, so that in Him we could be the righteousness of God. See, when I think about sin, when I think about my sin, I think about Jesus. I think about Jesus. There's something about looking at Jesus that makes sin clearer. But there's something about looking at Jesus that also clears away sin. So that's why when I talk about sin, I think about Jesus. Just think for those three words of of David. He uses the word, first of all, transgression. It's a bit of a complicated word. It really means rebellion. Rebellion. Everyone say rebellion. Good. So I'm not the only one talking about sin today. That's pretty good. The second word that he uses here is the word sin itself. But it really means very basically, sin really means offending the law, breaking the law. Someone who is offend, doing an offense and breaking the law. And the third word for sin that he uses here is the word iniquity, which really means guilt. So what is it? Rebellion, lawlessness, and guilt. 
And the text we just quoted about Jesus in 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that God made Jesus the rebel. He made Jesus the lawbreaker. He made Jesus the guilty one. Jesus was made sin for us. See, Jesus became what I am so that I can become what Jesus is. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't find many statements more astounding than that. And that's why we can join King David when we, we can say with him, as in verse 1 and 2 of Psalm 32, where in one of the translations, says, how joyful is the person whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. How joyful is the person whom the Lord does not charge or he doesn't count sin against that person with iniquity and in the spirit is no deceased. How joyful, how joyful. You see, to look to Jesus, you see how horrible sin is. And to look to Jesus, you see how wonderful forgiveness is. You look to Jesus for both. We don't usually do that. But you look to Jesus to see how horrible sin is. You look to Jesus to see how wonderful forgiveness is. It's like the inner city woman, a woman of the street. Life was ebbing away. She was dying of AIDS in her room. Shabby little place. But a good friend of hers came by and to sit by her and try and comfort her try to talk to her. But all she got from this woman was sobbing, crying, deep, heartfelt sobs and crying. And between those sobs, she would say things such as, I'm hopeless. I have no hope. My life is a mess. I have messed up many other people's lives. I deserve nothing but hell. And what would you say to a woman like that? What would you say to anyone who says that? Close to death. What would you say? Well, this friend of hers didn't say anything except she noticed there on her dresser was a picture. She knew the answer, but she still asked her and said, so who's that picture of on your dresser over there? Well, of course, she said, that's my daughter. That's the only beautiful thing in my life. I'll do anything for her. She means the world to me. And her friend said to her, well, if your daughter did all the things that you have done in your life, and she came to you at the end of her life and she said, will you forgive me? Will you? And this mother lying there in that bed says, yes, of course I will. She is the most precious thing that I have. Why do you ask that question? And her friend said, I asked you that question because I want you to know that God has your picture on his dresser. So I'd like to ask you at this moment then, right now as you think about yourself, do you believe right now that you are in God's eyes absolutely beautiful? in spite of anything you may have done. Absolutely beautiful in his eyes. Do you believe with all your heart right now that you are, in fact, precious to God, just as precious as Jesus, his son, is precious to him? You are that precious to God. Do you really believe that? Let me ask you something else. Do you find your joy, the source of your joy, in the fact that God has wiped away your sin? Is your joy found in the fact that God has written forgiven over all your sins? Is that where you find your joy? Is that what makes you joyful? I want you to know, friends, 
that the only thing that keeps us from knowing how horrible sin is, the only thing that keeps us from knowing how wonderful forgiveness is, is if we're looking at the wrong place. The wrong place. So where do you look to know what kind of a sinner you are? Where do you look to know that you are forgiven? Where do you look? Well, King David, as we read Psalm 32, the first part there is, he needed to look nowhere else but to himself to know that he was a pretty bad sinner. Looking to himself, he knew that he had committed horrible crimes. One terrible episode in his life was he took another man's wife, and he had a child with her. And then he killed the husband, and then he covered up that sin. Pretty horrible stuff. And no wonder, David says in Psalm 32, that God's hand was heavy on him. No wonder he knew that he was a pretty horrible sinner. No wonder he felt so guilty. The Bible actually says that he was suffering from physical, mental, and emotional deterioration. He was wasting away physically, mentally, emotionally from the burden of guilt that he was carrying. And no wonder, David, once he discovered that God forgave him, no wonder he was full of joy. Now, I don't know how many Davids are in this place who can identify with David. Then all we need to do is just look at our lives and we'll see how sinful we are. But what about, what if, what if we have not committed such grievous crimes as David did? What if we have lived our lives pretty much in compliance? Compliance with parents, teachers, church, compliance with God's Word, pretty much. No one does it perfectly, but we can look at our lives, and what if you know that you've never really rebelled? Maybe you look at your life and you say, I do not have a criminal record. I've never taken advantage of somebody else. What if we show kindness to people wherever we can, and we live with integrity? We contribute to the well-being of society. What sin would we be guilty of? What would we need to be forgiven of? Well, we're told in the Bible, and people quickly tell us, if you want to know that you're a sinner, just look at the law of God. Well, may I remind you that there was a man in the Bible, his name is Paul, who wrote more books in the Bible than anybody else, arguably the greatest theologian in Christianity outside Jesus, that that same Paul said in Philippians 3 verse 6, that he kept the law of God without fault, even while he was persecuting Christians. He had no guilt feelings. There was nothing in his life at that time that said to him, I need forgiveness. And then he saw Jesus. Everything changed. Then he became the man who even after conversion, after he knew he was forgiven, after he believed it with all his heart, he would still say, I am the chief of sinners. His eyes were now on Jesus. See, the Bible says that everyone has sinned. Yes, we know that from what the Bible says, even though we don't always feel like that is true about us as much as it is with those of those that we compare ourselves with. But the Bible still says everyone has sinned, and we have these degrees of sin, the grading of sin. We know about Christian sins. They're okay. We can live with those, not in God's eyes. And then there are those bad sins which we get rid of. At least we get rid of them before we are baptized. And then when we get baptized, well, you know, pride can carry on. There's no one's going to ask any questions. But the Bible says everyone has sinned. But don't forget the other part. It says we have all fallen short of, and I love this translation that says, we've fallen short of God's glorious standard. I wonder what you think that glorious standard is. 
Because when we consider that, then we realize that people who have committed horrible crimes, just like David did, and people who have lived compliant lives, they are all equally guilty. Equally guilty before God. So how can that be? Question is, is sin only doing horrible things? Or is sin anything that falls short of God's glorious standard, especially when you realize that God's glorious standard is Jesus Christ, who lived out God's holy law absolutely perfectly all the time, no breaks. That's God's glorious standard. And so, therefore, anything less than perfect love in every thought, in every word, in every action, in every motive, all the time, 24-7, to every person, under all circumstances, anything short of that is sin. So looking at Jesus, the one altogether righteous, who of us then will not confess and say, Oh Lord, have mercy on me. Hmm? Just looking to Jesus. And looking at Jesus, the one who was made sin for us, he became this spectacle of sin, looking to Jesus and seeing that, who of us then will not cry out in joy and say, oh, the joy of knowing my rebellion is forgiven, my sin is covered, my guilt is not counted against me. Looking to Jesus. So we have to start with Jesus when we talk about sin, not just when we start talking about forgiveness. His life reveals perfect love, his death reveals the horror of sin. And the Holy Spirit's job is to reveal Jesus to us in such a way that we will sense our guilt, our need for forgiveness, and the joy of being set free, knowing that we are right with God. You know, the Bible actually says that one of the most important things in life, in order to live a practical life, is to understand the concept of sin as it is presented in the Bible, but also to understand what forgiveness is. See, some people just stop with a sin issue and they, they never get over their guilt. Others just focus on only the forgiveness part, I'm not too sure what they've forgiven are, but at least it feels good to talk just about forgiveness. In Jesus, they are both there, sin and forgiveness. Looking to Jesus, we get both when we look to Jesus. So let's look at the cross for a moment here. Jesus on the cross, the Bible says, became a curse. That's strong language. I would never say that if it wasn't in the Bible. Jesus became a what? A curse. That means an awful spectacle. Here are a couple of verses in the Bible that tell us about that. In Isaiah 52, verse 14, it says there, Many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. He was a spectacle. Became cursed. Isaiah 53, 3 says, He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrow, is acquainted with deepest grief. But notice this, it says, We turned our backs on him. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. It was so horrible to look at. And then Habakkuk 1, verse 13 says, talking about God, the prophet says, God, your eyes are too pure to look upon evil. You cannot look at wrong. And now we understand why Jesus cried out with a loud voice, the Bible says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He became a spectacle. There's a statement in 
Manuscript 31, where Ellen White says, He was treated as a sinner that we might be treated as righteous. He became the spectacle so that we could become beautiful. So you go to the cross, you look at Jesus, and the Holy Spirit will help you see how awful sin is, not comparing with anyone else, not even looking within to see how sinful we are, not looking at a checklist of rules and regulations. Look to Jesus. Look to what He was made in your place. A spectacle, a curse. Look to Jesus. And you go to the cross and you look at Jesus and the Holy Spirit will also help you how, to know how wonderful forgiveness is. You see, there's a proportion here. The more you understand the depth of sin and the bigness and the horror of sin, the more you'll appreciate and enjoy and rejoice in forgiveness. And then forgiveness will not be some cheap word that you just take hold of because, well, it's handed out, so I'll take it. Forgiveness then becomes a life-changing reality. So Jesus on the cross became a curse. And Jesus on the cross became also the cure for sin. The curse, the cure. Let's talk about the cure. Now, David uses those three words to describe sin, but he also uses three words to explain about this cure of sin. Three words. Maybe you've noticed them there. It means he says God forgives, and then he says God covers, and then he says God does not count sin. So the word count is in there. God does not count our sins against us. What are those three words? Forgive, cover, and count. Let's talk about forgiveness for a moment. That word forgiveness, again, it's become a very, a word we're so used to, but in the Hebrew, Forgiveness means the burden has been lifted off your shoulders. It's been lifted off your shoulders, put onto somebody else. It's just removed from you, and you feel lighter, lighter. Jesus said, come to me, and let me take your yoke. Rest in me. Sin is that burden. Forgiveness is the lifting of the burden. Moving to the other one, cover. Cover means that guilt is no longer seen. It's no longer seen even by the eyes of God who sees everything. And He's the judge. And He has the record. And He has a perfect memory, except when He chooses to forgive. As far as the east is from the west, so far as God removed our transgressions from us. Micah says he has cast them into the depths of the ocean. So cover means that that guilt is no longer seen by God. Why? Because our sin is now covered with the blood of Jesus. Covered. So forgiven and covered. Then there's the one that says count. He, hasn't, he doesn't count our sins against us. Like the judge who says, I will not count this against you. It's gone. How do you like those words? Forgiven, covered, it's not counted against you. Imagine being in a class and you get an F on a test. I know that feeling, even though many of you didn't. I come from a system in high school, elementary school, high school, even in college, where earning an A for anything meant you were close to genius. So I decided, I'm not a genius, so I will work like crazy to try and get an A. And then I squeaked in with a low C. Because you had to work really hard. You had to be very smart to get an A. When it came to America, my boys, our boys were in you know, elementary school, high school. They came home with A's regularly, and I thought, where did you get that from, your mom? Not from me. Then I discovered that the British system, sorry guys, I'm just going to say it, I know I've got Americans in front, I'm also an American, not by birth, but 
and not by education either, but in America, it's a lot easier to get an A than it is in the British system. Some of you know that because you've tried the British system. So here comes the teacher, and he finds you, and he sees that you have, yeah, there's an F. It's easier to get an F in, in Africa and in, and in England. The teacher sees the F. Has mercy on you. And he says, I'll tell you what. I'm not going to count this F against you. I'm going to cover it over. Maybe with an eraser or something. I'm going to count. I'm going to, I'm going to cover it over. I'm not going to take it into account when I give you your final grade. And what happens to you? The burden lifts off your shoulders, right? Yeah, it just lifts. You feel a ton lighter. And even though you're an introvert, you say, hallelujah. And no one stops you. And no one says, who? Calm down. No. It's hallelujah or along. But our heavenly father goes further than that. He not only covers over our F, he not only lifts the burden from us, he not only says, I won't count that F against you, he replaces the F with an A. May I say, a British A? <laughs> Sorry. Now, David, in Psalm 32, he's all about talking how God gets rid of the F, covers it, lifts it, doesn't count it against you. Paul takes the very same words of David in Psalm 32, and he gives it the added meaning since Jesus has come, and he says, this is all about not getting rid of your F, but giving you the A. Here it is, Romans 4 verse 5. He says, people are counted as righteous. Because by faith, God has forgiven their sins. So the moment God wipes away your sin, lifts the burden, covers it with the blood of Jesus, the moment God says, it's all gone, I won't count it against you, at that moment, He also gives you the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the A. And you say, hallelujah, even in church. Paul says, when God does not count our sins against us, He counts us as righteous, as Jesus is. God declares those that He forgives righteous. The curse of sin changes into the cure for sin. Is that real for you today? If you're still hoping for that, what? stops you from having that as a reality in your heart and mind today. You say your record? No, no, he covered that. He removed that. He's replaced that bad record with the perfect record of Jesus. Take hold of it. Believe it. It's on this word cover. You know what the crucifixion is? One of the things about the crucifixion of Jesus was a terrible death through exposure. Exposure. You see, Jesus was stripped. He was uncovered so that he hung on the cross totally naked, exposed to the elements, exposed to the jeers and the mocking cries of the crowd, exposed to the gazing eyes of those who looked at him with shame and with scorn. He was exposed. He was uncovered. Why did Jesus go through that? He could have been beheaded in some Roman prison. He could have been stoned. Many ways in which Jesus could have been killed. Why was he crucified? It is because Jesus chose to be uncovered while we deserve to be uncovered. He was uncovered for us. He was uncovered on the cross so that we can be covered by His blood. Covered. Covered. 
You know, we like to cover our sins by trying to be good enough. We try and cover our sins by denying them. We try and cover our sins by punishing ourselves. But when we stop trying to cover our sins, that's when God really covers us. Really covers us. It's a rainy day. Dad was driving his car through the rain, pelting onto the car, onto the windshield, heavy downpour. And he had his little six-year-old sitting on her seat in the back, and suddenly his daughter, her name was Aspen, she spoke up, and she was in this relaxed position there, sitting and watching the rain and all that, and then she came up with this idea. She said, Dad, I'm thinking about something, and Dad knew that when she was thinking about something, that means she has been considering some profound idea for a while, and now she was ready to reveal her great idea. So Dad says, tell me about it. And Aspen is ready. She says, Dad, hmm. The rain, there's so much of it. It's like sin. There's a lot of it, but the windshield wipers of God is wiping it all away. And a dad sat there behind the wheel, and when the goosebumps were running all over, up and down his arms, and finally he composed himself a little bit, and he thought, I wonder... I wonder how far my little girl will take that revelation. So he asked her the question, says, Aspen, do you notice that the rain keeps on coming? And without a batting an eyelid, she said, oh, yeah. That's because we keep sinning, and God keeps wiping it away. I've got something else to think about now when I'm watching the wipers clean my windshield. I want to ask you a question. Is there some area in your life today that needs God's windshield wiper? What about that? Have you been squinting hard to look at the world through your sin-drenched window? Are you living with shame and guilt blinding you? Perhaps you've been anesthetized to believe that guilt and shame is just the way to live. I've got to just get used to it. I invite you today. Turn on God's windshield wipers. That means receive Jesus into your heart. Again and again and again. And know that when you do that, it means that looking at Jesus, the Holy Spirit will help you see what sin really is, how horrible it is. But He never leaves you there. He gets you to keep looking to Jesus, and the reality and the wonder of forgiveness washes over you. You know when this happens best? And it happens every time. Simply when Jesus comes nearer, still nearer. And the nearer Jesus comes into our hearts, the more the windshield wipers work. And He shows us our sin that He carried. He shows us His forgiveness that He gives. Nearer, still nearer. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. Thank you for the crucified Jesus. Thank you for the Jesus who was willing to be stripped and uncovered so that we can be covered, covered with your righteousness, covered with your blood, transformed because of that. God, I pray, I ask that each one of us will allow you to do that miracle in our hearts today and every day, every day. We can only say thank you, and please draw nearer, closer every day. Amen. We trust your relationship with God has been strengthened from what you have heard today. Please visit our website at www.fletchersda.org. May God give you His peace and joy.